What up, y'all? I want to uh, do a little something different today, right? So tomorrow we're going to continue with the fruits of the Holy Spirit, which is next up is peace. So we'll talk about peace tomorrow. But today I want to do a little something different. This is something I had, um, had prepared for a few years. The first time I gave it, it wasn't as, hmm, it wasn't as biblically sound. And of course, the Holy Spirit wasn't really speaking through me at that time. So it was, I was trying to rush it. So I think it's a little bit better now. So let's go with it from there. And also got to let y'all know I'm getting um, one of those mounts. So I'll be able to record it, you know, horizontal wise. So it won't be those little bars when you put it on the full screen. Because I know that irks some people. But um, we're going to start with a question as we always do, right? Have you put God in a box, right? And I know, I know many people have put God in the box, right? I have a few suggestions just to, you know, make you think about things, make you start opening up to how I see God, how I've experienced God, and how other people have experienced God. Because I want to let you know a little secret, right? The kingdom of God works by faith, right? It's by faith that we're saved. It's by faith that we receive salvation. Everything else is through faith. Like, okay. Even if I tell you about the kingdom of God and I preach to you, repent for the kingdom of God is near. If you don't have enough faith to believe the words that came out of my mouth, you will never repent. But that's not my fault. Just as Jesus, he can preach all those great sermons he wanted to. Or that he was chosen and he was, he was called, he was prepared, he was anointed to preach those sermons, to do those miracles. But if you don't believe that he can do miracles, then what benefit does it have? Right? That's why when he would do a certain miracle with people, he would always ask them a question first. Do you want to be made well? Do you believe that I can do such things? Do you believe what the what the uh what the prophets and the people and the people that wrote the psalm said about me? Do you believe what the book of Daniel says about me? Do you believe that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins? Yes. And if you do, then I'll forgive your sins. But if you don't believe that I have the authority to forgive sins, why are you even here? If you don't believe that I can do miracles, why are you asking me to do a miracle? Right, because God only works by faith. Now, this is another. This is just a, a situation that's in the Bible that I didn't even put in the scripture. But there's a man named what's it? Is it Titus? It's not Titus. What is his name? What is his name? Ah, uh, it's not Titus. God, what is his name? Darn it! But he's a Pharisee, man. I, I'll get his name. I'll probably put it in the description once I figure it out again. But it's a guy, he was a Pharisee, and this is while Jesus was walking through the different towns giving preachings, right? So his name is spreading throughout the throughout the nations or the countries at that time, throughout the, the small little areas of lands. And everybody's knowing that he has the power to do things, right? And the guy comes up to him and asks him, I mean, not, he calls him rabbi because back then, rabbi, you know, that means teacher. So he was called, he said, rabbi, rabbi, I need your help. My daughter is dying. And she, you know, if, if you don't come right now, she's going to die. And he was on the way he was going. He listened to him. He decided he was going to help him because, you know, the spirit is always willing. It's the flesh that's weak. Right. So because Jesus had the most of the spirit of God that we've ever seen, it's why he was always so willing to do things, because the Holy Spirit is always willing to help. It's a helper. After all, it, he he the Holy Spirit, he this new expression of God, he is a helper. And because he is a helper, he's always willing to help. But our flesh is weak, which is why we have to be willing to by faith to ask the Holy Spirit to come into our lives and do something, right? So, you know, it's like by by faith is that we are saved. We don't get saved because Jesus Christ died on the cross. We are saved because we believe in the power that Jesus Christ spoke of. We're saved because, oh, we worship because we believe in what Jesus Christ is and what he has done for us and what the Father has provided for us. And we also know the works of the Holy Spirit. So it's by faith that we're saved. It's by faith that we come to God and pray because how, how can you pray? How can you pray without faith? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And a man that's in the flesh is an enemy of God. So it's, it's either two kingdoms. Either you, either you serve the kingdom of God or you serve the kingdom of darkness. And the kingdom of darkness would never pray. They would never have you pray, right? So it's, it's only when you start to believe God and his word that you start to pray. And then only that you believe that he can hear you will he start to hear you and answer. Everything that happens, happens by faith. Nothing happens just by expectation. But because you have faith and you spend time in the presence of God as much, now you form an expectation within yourself because you know that God is able to do exceedingly and exceedingly. You know that God is able to do exceedingly 
more exceeding he's able to do exceedingly more than we ever ask think or imagine according to the power that worketh in us the power that works in us is the holy spirit so by faith we receive the holy spirit and by faith we believe that the holy spirit can do whatever we ask him to do because he says by faith if you pray to the father and ask anything and in, in my name and you say in jesus name you will receive it if you if you believe that you have received it it will be yours by faith everything is by faith right so that's just to start it off. That's just something that happened, right? And while he was doing the miracle for the man's daughter, he was going to, he was going to, because uh, the guy said she had died, right? Because Jesus was walking. He was walking. He was taking a, he was taking a little bit of time, right? You know how Jesus does. Sometimes he'll take time to test your faith just to see what you're going to do. And the guy the whole time, you, you know, he's, he's walking behind him. He's, he's, she's dying. She's dying. He didn't even know that his daughter had died. Two servants that worked at his land came and told him, Hey man, it's all good. You don't need to teach her anymore. Je you know, you don't have to go there anymore. Jesus, she did. And Jesus said, she's not dead. She's sleeping. You know, and Jesus loved doing that. He did the same thing with Lazarus. When they said Lazarus was dead, he took three days to get to the tomb. Once he gets to the tomb after three days, he said, what? Lazarus, wake up. And he woke right up. He was alive. Of course he was actually dead, but Jesus, that's how, you know, he, 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 he funny, man, right? He say, he say you sleep, but you really did. He knows that he can do anything. But he wants you to believe it. If you believe she's dead, you wouldn't even have the faith to believe in a miracle. But if you believe it, he's saying that about her being asleep, you still have the faith to believe. And that's all he needs is a little bit of faith. He tells us in the book of Matthew that if you have faith as a mustard seed, which is something like that. Like if you have faith as a mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, remove and be thrown into the sea and it will remove for you. So God just needs a little bit of faith. But um, the reason why I'm telling you all this story is because when he finally got to the man's house, he was going to heal the daughter. It was some Pharisees, you know how the Pharisees, they always come around when he's doing miracles. And they would come around, they had they had no faith in God. They had no faith that he could do what he was going to do. So he told them all to get out. He said, okay, all y'all get out, and there's going to be me and the daughter here. And then they, everybody left, and then he healed her. And then when she got up, he let everybody come back in. And why is that? Because the Spirit is willing. He's the walking Spirit of God. He's the walking Word of God. He can do anything. But if you don't have enough faith, you are you're blocking up his power. You're blocking up the miracle that can happen, right? So everything that we do is by faith. If you don't have faith, you will never see anything, right? You can't try to come to God with understanding because we can't understand God. The Bible tells us that his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So if we go into God trying to understand, we'll never get it because God is everlasting to everlasting. He was God before we ever was existing, before the earth was existing, before, we don't know what planet he created first. We don't know how space and time come to be. We just know God has existed before everything and God will exist after everything. After the earth is gone and God comes back and put us into heaven and come back from heaven, God is still God. God never dies. This is why God can give us this glorious body that never dies, that never gets sick, that never needs, you know, a vaccine like they're trying to get people to take now. All of these things make, make sense, right? And of course, you got an adversary that's always trying to get you to doubt, right? The, the Bible says that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So you got to be very careful who you have around you because your little baby faith, sometimes it's not enough to carry you, right? So you got to be really careful who you got around you. If you speak in faith and they're speaking death, because the Bible tells us in Proverbs 29 that life and death is in the power of the tongue. Let those who love it eat the fruit thereof. It don't have to be you speaking it because if somebody speaks a lie into your head and you believe it, they got you. That's what the devil, that's why he always try to plant evil thoughts in your head or doubting thoughts or fearful thoughts. Because if he gets you to believe it, then you can't work for God. Because now you, it takes faith to work for God. And fear is going to stop faith. Doubt going to stop faith. So just be careful. But I got a few um, statements to start this off outside of what I just did. Number one is, many believe, I said, um, what box have you put God in, right? First I said, how have you put God in the box, Right? And then what box have you put him in? What what part of your life has you stopped believing God for? What part of your life have you stopped believing that God can do a miracle? Because I can tell you for a fact, God is still speaking and God is still doing miracles. But uh, let's continue. Many, many, many Christians, many people that call themselves Christians don't believe that God is still speaking in this current time. Many that call themselves Christians don't believe that Satan is real. Many that call themselves Christians don't know that they have demons. Right now, I don't mean that because before we're saved, you could be a, you could be possessed by a demon. But once you get saved, you can no longer be possessed because now your soul belongs to God. Right. All that you can sell your soul. No one can sell their soul. No one can. All you can do is give place to the devil. Right. So 
if you're saved, you can never, you can't, you can no longer be possessed by a demon, but you can't be oppressed by a demon, right? So they could be assigned to you, and they know, they know God's plan for your life. They watch you, right? Because all demons do. While we're at home, and like this, is not what I do now. But let's say back then when I wasn't as knowledgeable or as willing to walk in my calling, and I'm entertaining Netflix and I'm watching a show that's you know evil that has evil elements in it. I'm not seeing that there's demonic spirits sitting on side of me because I can't see the spiritual realm. I can feel it, I can hear it, but I can't see it. Especially when you're not in God's presence, you can see it and hear it and feel it even less. So you don't even realize that there's that cold air that you feel is a demonic spirit is watching you. It's watching your every waking move so it can find a weakness. And that's when it attacks. But people don't believe that Satan is real. And these are the same people that are laden with demons, right? You get inside a church service or you start worshiping God around them, watch they run away. Because they're, they're either going, Satan has a lot of ways to get at us, but distraction is the main one. Deception, which is he can use 90% of the Bible truth and then use 10% as a lie. Like when he tempted Jesus in the garden, I mean, not in the, garden, in the wilderness, he said, if you are the son of man, throw yourself down from these mountains and the angels will pick you up. Because that was that's Psalm 91, the angels will bear you up. But the Bible goes on to say right after that in Psalms 91, the angels shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against the stone. All that saying is the angels will protect you if you're innocent or if something happens outside of your control, right? Because the angels said they'll protect you from darkness and evil. But if you were giving place to the devil, he's not going to protect you. So if Jesus would have threw himself off that mountain, he would have been dead. It wouldn't have been no save. It wouldn't have been no nothing. It would have just been over. And that was his whole trick. He can use 90% of the scripture and then put 10% of a lie or omit part of the truth. And then he got you. That's why you got to really be in your word, really be studying. And don't let them negative thoughts get to you, man, because I go through the same thing just like you. But you see what I'm doing? So it's it's possible, right? It's possible to overcome anything. He has no authority. You have to understand that. You have to believe it. Do you believe that you can cast out demons? Because you can. You can, like people that have never been saved can be possessed by demons, but they have no authority over you. So don't have no fear. Just in Jesus' name, I command you to get out. Like right? sometimes you might have to say it two or three times. It just depends on how strong the demon is, right? It depends on how long they've been there, what they're there to do, like what assignment are they on? Because man, unsaved people, man, they are. They're literally wastelands, right? That's what demons congregate at because they know that they own them people's soul. And so you get saved, Jesus Christ has now redeemed you. That's why his, one of his names is called the Redeemer. He can redeem any situation, but it's by faith that we can be redeemed. All right, so I got a few other ones. I said, many people don't know that they have demons. They manifest only at certain times, right? So when I was saying about people, if you don't know you have demons, how about you sing worship songs? How about you literally go in there and really believe and sing worship songs and see if see if something don't try to manifest out of you or try to get you to stop? And there's a there's the one of the main things I've seen in a Christian faith is that when you start getting back in your Bible, when you start reading your Bible again, you're gonna feel a witch like a you're gonna feel an attack, right? It's a demonic attack, it's a demonic spirit. I can't identify exactly what it is, but it's right when you start reading your Bible again, you're gonna start getting sleepy. You done been up 10 hours, you've been twerking, you've been smoking weed, you've been drinking, you've been having a great time. The minute you try to give God any time, you're going to start falling asleep. You ain't fall asleep off the weed, you didn't fall asleep off the pornography, you didn't fall asleep off the good Netflix show, but as soon as you get in your word, you fall asleep. That's a textbook attack by the devil, right? So you got to be aware of these type of things. Like you're not sleepy because you're tired, you're sleepy because he's trying to get you to claim darkness. He's trying to get you to stay in the darkness. And if you, the more you read that word, you're going to get light. And he's not going to have no power over you. So he's doing anything he can to get you to not read that word. So really, this message today is about what are you what are you scared that God, what are you scared to submit to God and you think he can't overcome for you? Or he can't give you the strength to overcome it. Because we can, we we have the power within us. Once we're saved, we have the power within us to overcome all demonic attacks. That's why it's like, it's really no, it's no excuse for a man to not be holy. It's no excuse for a man to still live a pitiful life after he's seen the works of Jesus Christ. It's, it's no excuse. It's none at all because God give us all the power to do everything that Peter, Paul, James, John has done. Casting out devils, healing the sick, baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We have all those powers. Prophecy, um, speaking in tongues, gift of interpretation of tongues. We just have to ask. If you ask for spiritual gifts, your Heavenly Father will give you spiritual gifts. But he only gives it in a proportion to your faith. So if your faith is small, you can only prophesy in part. If your faith is small, you can only interpret in part. If your faith is small, you can only know things in part. You can only receive wisdom in part, right? Everything is activated by we taking a few steps. Like 
I can only be here if I spend time every day reading my word over years. I'm not talking about three, four days a week. I'm talking about years every day spending hours reading this word is why I can give it to you and, you know, not need too much of a, not need too much of a guideline or not need too much of help because I know it, right? I know it, I know it enough to be able to get it and present it back to you in a way that's digestible, right? Easy to understand. So I have another one. Um, if you don't believe that Satan is still working in this current world, then tell me why has the world at large, right? So most of the world has ran to get an untested and unproven vaccine for an illness that has a 99% survival rate. That's crazy in itself. Psalms 91 will protect you. It said that because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall the pestilence come near you. What do you think a disease is? It's a pestilence. That's, we can go into the four horsemen and all that later, but a disease is a pestilence, right? So if you don't read your word, you are already scared. You're thinking that what these people are saying is true. It's trust, trust me, it's not. I haven't gotten sick not once. Now, maybe it's because of my faith or maybe just because it's not really real. I don't know exactly, but I know my faith has kept me strong over, the, over the, all these, what is this, two years? Almost two years? I ain't got sick not once. I ain't missed a day of work. I ain't missed a day of sleep. I ain't missed nothing ever never cough never sneeze never lost anything no one around me is sick except the people that's unfaithful like only only the people who doesn't believe the word of god and i ain't gonna call no names but only people that's around me that don't really believe that don't really believe that god is a healer that god is god of the world that god makes the rules and that no matter what you put inside your body if you're praying if you are thankful like we're talking food i'm not talking about a disease right a disease is different but we're talking about food, right? So what the devil meant for your, what the devil meant for evil, God meant for your good. The Bible tells us that back in the old days, you can only eat certain animals because they were called clean animals. They were unclean animals. But nowadays you can eat anything as long as you eat it with Thanksgiving. You eat it being thankful to the father, anything. That means if you're a Christian and you still think you have to live by eating pork and not eat pork, you're a fool. That's not in the Bible. You got to read your word and stop being religious. That's called religion. We're we'll getting there later, actually. So um, I was talking about the vaccine and all that, right? The 99% survival rate. So this is a textbook Satan move. It's called the spirit of fear, right? So demonic spirits are usually named after what they do. They bring fear. They bring doubt. It's a spirit of doubt. They, 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 um, they allow you to not be able to hear the spiritual things and not be able to understand what's going on inside your ear. It's the spirit of death, right? The spirit of dumb, the spirit of blind. Like it's not, it's not all as, it's not as pretty as you would think it is. They don't have names like we do, like Michael, Devin. You know, they don't have names like that. It's more dumb, uh, darkness, uh, abuse, uh, fear. Like it's stupid stuff like that. But um, going on to say that it's a demonic entity that Satan has used in the past, <clears throat> and I can prove it in Scripture, right? But see, the thing, the thing about this is. The Bible, in some in some translations, it tells you that God sent the evil spirit upon Saul. And that's true. God can send evil spirits upon you, but God does not tempt evil. Like, God is not tempted by evil, nor does he tempt him, nor does He tempt anyone. The reason why the Bible says that God sent the, the evil spirit is not because he actually picked out the evil spirit from hell and threw it on Saul. It's because God is still the God of the just and the unjust, right? This is why God wants us to bless those who curse us and to pray for those who spitefully use us because God is still the God of evil. Even if they don't respect him or they don't accept him, he's still the God of Satan. He's still Satan's father, no matter what. He still cares about Satan, right? This is why he hasn't thrown him into the lake of fire yet. He still cares about certain demons and angels and fallen angels because that's why he hasn't thrown them into hell yet. It's a reason why we're fighting this war is because they're not in hell yet. Your, God, your father's a good father. Like some of us should be in hell right now for the sins that we've committed. Most of us are, according to the law, we all should be in hell, but we're not because he's a good father. He's a good father to not just the just, but to the unjust as well. Look, you can look around and see, just pick something and you can see God's work. The trees growing tall is God. The trees depend on God to have enough nutrients to feed them from their big roots. The, the buildings that we create, even if you don't believe in God, somebody created plaster. Who created plaster? Somebody who had an idea from the Holy Spirit. Who created concrete, gravel that we walk on? Someone who had an idea from the Holy Spirit. Who created these paint lines that make a parking lot? Someone who had an idea from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is always working, even if you don't accept him as the Holy Spirit. He knows he's a witness to everything we've done, good or bad. 
just and unjust, Jew and the Greek. That means the Jew and the Gentile. No matter what, the Holy Spirit is always at work. And God is always God of all good and evil. He rises up kings and he tears down kings. He does whatever he wants. No one can say, right, what does the Bible tell us when he's talking to Nicodemus? The wind blows from the east to the west and no man can know it. Where does the wind come from? We don't know where the wind comes from. So too is how the spirit world works. We don't know where it comes from, but we know we can hear it. We know we hear his voice. We recognize his voice. And we also recognize the adversary's voice. We recognize demonic voices and what they're trying to do and what they're trying to work out of us. And that's by faith, by faith that we can understand and have the strength to fight. And if you ever get too weak, if you feel like you're too weak to fight, it's an easy thing. Father, help me. Father, say, you know, Father, speak. Say, pray how you want to pray. I'm not going to give y'all my, my keys, but pray how you want to pray. But let me um let me take y'all on the first Samuel chapter 13 when it's the spirit of fear. And you can see how this affected the Israelite army at the time. So at this time, the Israelites were at war during the reign, during the reign of King Saul. Israel was outnumbered, like because they were surrounded on all sides, they were outnumbered. And this resulted in the Israelites being shaken with fear and unable to fight. Now we're talking about the same Israelites that God rescued from Egypt. God did mighty miracles. He split the Red Sea. He used a pillar of fire at night so they can travel. He used a pillar, a uh, pillar of clouds in daytime so they can travel. I mean, they have seen God do miracles. They've seen the Jericho walls fall. They've seen that. They've seen God send Joseph to Egypt and then increase the trials of Israel by two. They've seen God keep them in the middle of a famine. They've seen God keep them in the middle of a famine. This Siri thing keeps activating, man. The, the, the devil is getting in the darn way, man. Siri keeps activating. I didn't say nothing about it, right? So they've seen God work in the middle of a famine and keep them through sending Joseph to Egypt, right? So God always makes a way. We've I've just told you recently about Nebuchadnezzar and how God has saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the flames, right? He says that when you go through the fire, it shall not burn you. And when you go through the water and the rivers, they shall not overtake you, right? So we're talking some real Bible right here. That's why you're trying to get in our way. Well, let's keep going though. The resulted, this resulted in the Israelites being shaken with fear and unable to fight. Some hid in caves and bushes to escape. They were so scared, they hid in caves and bushes. Men of war, men that been at war all their life, they hiding in caves because they scared. Does that sound like the spirit of God is in them or the spirit of fear? That's ridiculous, right? Keep going. The command from God was to wait for Samuel to arrive on the battlefield, then sacrifice the burnt offering and the fellowship offering. Because back then, I told you they had to carry the ark of God, right? So they had to do everything by respect when it's the Old Testament. You couldn't just go and do things like we do now because Jesus Christ is always with us. Like we can always easily ask the Father for something. He can give us exactly what we need in real time. Back then, you had to do a certain burnt offering and certain animals and all that stuff like I told you in previous videos. So I tell you what alone. But because Saul's men started to depart from the battlefield on the because the command was to wait till Samuel the prophet got there, right? So usually when you went to war, the king was the one who would lead them into war. But Samuel or the prophet of that age, the prophet of that time would have to burn the offerings towards God and God would speak to them what's going to happen. And that's how you would get your prophecy of what's going to happen. Like it would be like God would deliver the Midianites into your hand and it would be like you're fighting with one man. That's in Judges chapter six, Gideon versus the Midianites. Or it would be... God has chosen you to begin to deliver Israel from the Philistines. That's later in Judges. And that's We talk about Samson before Delilah cut his hair and all the other stuff. So usually there's a prophet or someone that's, you know, a priest that gets the word from God. And that that's what Samuel's role was. So he was supposed to wait for seven days till Samuel got there to, to burn the offerings. So that, that would give you the, the go ahead to know that God's presence is with you in the war. Because if God's presence is with you, you can do anything, right? So... On the seventh day, he waited all the seven. So he did what God asked him to do, partially. He waited seven days. He looked around. Samuel didn't show up on the seventh day. And then Saul decided, because his men were in fear and they were departing from the battlefield, Saul himself decided to sacrifice the burnt offering. And that's sacrilege. That's breaking the direct commandment from God. And of course, that is going to pr pretty much pervert the whole cause that we're out here for. We're out here to serve God, but because you're doing what you want to do, you're acting out of your flesh, it's like the same thing as... If God is trying to work something out of you and you decide to sin, right? You decide, I'm not going to trust God. I'm going to quit and I'm going to sin. You completely ruined everything. You completely went back to square one. Because no matter what God was trying to do, it's now hold, it's held up in between. Because now Satan has to fight. Now he's fighting Satan. Now he's fighting whatever demon that you you just gave him, you, you gave him place to. Now you have to fight him. So now you got to send an angel to fight as opposed to you just getting a blessing. 
in time, right? Now you got to fight over it. Like I told you about Daniel and the principality, the the, um, the Persian prince, the prince, the principality of Persia at the time was holding up Daniel's prayers for 21 days. And Michael, the archangel, which what we know is Michael is the one who kicked Lucifer out of heaven. So that's a pretty strong um, principality, a pretty strong demonic entity. And he's holding up Michael. Michael beat Lucifer. So that means the principalities are stronger than the devil. The devil is, he's the power of the air. He's the prince. He, he controls them or he, he, you know, they, they follow his commands, but the principalities are stronger than the devil. So it's, it's, hey, it's a lot of stuff, man. But, um, like I said, this broke a direct commandment from God and Samuel showed up, which is quick. Cause this is how God would do sometimes. Like it's happened to me. As soon as you disobey the person that was supposed to be the blessing, the blessing that you were hoping and wishing and praying for, it shows up right after that. And you know, at that, like that conviction in your heart, it's ridiculous. You can't shake it. Samuel showed up right as he finished offering the burnt, as he finished burning the burnt offering. And then he said, you have disobeyed God. You have done something wicked in the sight of the Lord. You should repent, you know, and th this was the start of Saul's fall from grace because we know other things have happened and that's how David took over. But this is the first time he disobeyed God. He'll do it later on, of course, because he was an insecure person. He didn't actually have enough faith to believe it. We're going to move on to another example because... In my opinion, I feel like as the bride of God, right? Because the church is the bride of God. This, you know, the Bible calls him the bridegroom and we're, I don't know, whatever they call the woman in, in the marriage, right? It's not on some weird homosexuality stuff. It's just, it's a metaphor, right? God loves the church. God loves his, his, his people, the Jewish faith. He loves the Christian faith, right? Everything has evolved over time, but he loves you so much that we're called the bride of God. That's why the Bible tells us to love your wife as God has loved the church. So as a bride of God, we must have re we have to realize that God is our equalizer. We also have to realize that nothing is impossible when we invite God into the situation. So that's directly relating to the boxes that we put God in. He said, with man, this is impossible. Siri came on again. He said, with man, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. So I'm gonna take you to Isaiah chapter 66, verses one through two, to give you another example. Read it directly from the new this is from the New Interna what is it? Yeah, New International Version. It says, This is what the Lord says. This is the prophet Isaiah speaking on the Lord's behalf. This is what the Lord says. And now he's gonna say what the Lord told him. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? Where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? So they come into being, declares the Lord. These are the ones who I look on with favor, those who are humble and contrite in spirit. And who tremble at my word so this was this is in the old testament the book of the prophets but this is god speaking on what was going to happen after jesus christ dies on the cross right so after he dies on the cross we have now become the holy tabernacle for the holy spirit to dwell in as long as we don't live in sin and we don't stand in the path of the, the counsel of the ungodly and we don't sin the holy spirit can always come and give you what you need immediately in real time so this is the new thing that we have but back then, God needed a temple. He needed a tabernacle to dwell in, right? When the Israelites were in, when they first came out of Egypt, they had a tabernacle, which is like a temporary tent where they kept the Ark of God. And then when David was a king, they was carrying the Ark of God around, right? And then it became the big temple, the huge temple that Solomon built that was arrayed with gold and silver and all these beautiful gemstones because they had they had traded with other nations and Israel, like, Israel had become a very rich nation under King Solomon. Because David brought peace. He went to war all like pretty much the whole time of his reign. Him and Saul had wars with the Philistines and they had beat all the enemies of God. And then when Solomon took over as king, all he really had to do was just sit there, be wise, and then make business deals. So they got really rich and built a beautiful temple. But because they had turned to other gods, which was something Solomon did. I can talk about that later. That was something that Solomon did because he had married so many women that wasn't of the Jewish faith. So we had a few, few from the Jewish, from the Israelite faith, and most of them from like Moab, Moab and Phoenicia. And, and you know, they all serve it. I told you, they all serve in demons. You call them gods, but they're just, they're, they're creations of God that have forgot their place in the, in the order, right? It's like a prideful human being. When you forget your place in the order, God humbles you. So that's why they're going to hell. They're going to burn in hell forever and be tortured and tormented forever because they forgot their place in the Lord and they didn't repent. So we're moving on. Oh, I just talked about repent, right? That's crazy. The next <laughs> the next point is, so what does it mean to biblically repent, right? What does it mean to biblically repent? And um, I can prove that to you in 2 Corinthians 
chapter 7, verse 10. But it says, 2 second, second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, godly sorrow, right? Godly sorrow brings repentance. And godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death, right? So what is the sorrow of the world? This is sorrow that lacks humility. Remember, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. We must repent because we hate sin. We don't repent to get something or to, you know, to feel better or to just like pretty much to take advantage of the kingdom of God. We're not to take advantage of the grace that God has given us. We are supposed to repent from our wicked ways. And all to repent means is to turn from your, the way you're doing things. So say if you've always taken a left turn your whole life, like just metaphorically to make it easy for people to understand. If you've always taken a left turn on your right, on your path, but you get lost in the street, which is like what we do when we're sinning. And then we ask God, we ask God to come take it away. God may ask you to do a right turn, right? And that's all it is, like to turn away from how you've been doing things. If all you've known is to watch pornography and be addicted, God may want to get you married in the next few years. But he can't have you going into that marriage with them kind of demons strapped to you. This is why you have to turn from your wicked ways and allow God to make you holy and to rebuild you into the husband that he need he needs you to be for the woman because God cares about all of us. God won't put you in a marriage that you can't handle. And no he put that woman in a marriage that she can't handle. All of those marriages that's breaking up like that, that's not godly. That's people that chose to do what they want to do. And God is not in it. When God is not in it, he won't bless it. No matter how long you pray, he will not bless what he did not ordain. Period. So get that through our heads. So the sorrow of the world. Okay, I told you. We must repent because we hate sin. The way to hate sin is to know the destructive power of sin. Sin is what separates us from our heavenly father. And therefore, it leads to spiritual death. That's what going to hell means, to be dead in the spirit. Right? Because we all have to die in the flesh. Every man has to die in the flesh. But we can't die in the spirit. If you die in the spirit, you're done, though. You're never coming back. It's over. That's why the resurrection is a thing, right? Jesus Christ died in the flesh on the cross, but he rose again in the spirit because he completed the work of the Father. And the same thing is going to happen to us. Well, most of us, if you're a real Christian, you're a believer, you'll go into rapture. So you won't actually die a human death. But those who are not Christians right now and become Christians later on through what they've seen through the rapture or something like that, and the great tribulation come, those people have to die in the flesh because once the beast come and the antichrist come, every Christian will get killed. Right. The Bible tells us that they will contend with the dragon. They will contend with the devil. And God himself has given the devil power over the saints to overcome them. So if you are if you are Christian in the last, the, the really last days after the rapture, after the rapture happened, you still you still stuck here. You're going to get killed. So be prepared. If that's what happens, prepare yourself now. You will get killed for the faith, because if you don't, you got to worship the mark of the beast. If you worship the mark of the beast and get that, you're going to hell forever. and You never can be saved. After you get the mark of the beast, you can no longer be saved. So it's very important that you get your life right with God right now so that you can be part of the rapture. You don't want to be part of that because that's going to be so hard to endure, so hard to still praise and worship God because who's to say they won't make Bibles illegal, right? Who's to say? Who's to say? We don't know what they're going to do because, I mean, the devil, he has, if you don't think the devil has power, you're a fool. Every time you let the devil in, he got he can do something to you. Anytime we give place to the devil, he can do something. He can cause us to sin. He can put doubt into our mind. He can put fear into our minds. He can make us argue with our children. Like there's so many commandments in the Bible that people are not following, right? Usually parents, when they read Ephesians chapter six, they get hyped, right? Ephesians chapter six, verse one, the Bible says to honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. So honor your father and mother, whatever they ask you to do, you're supposed to do willingly. But the problem is, the Bible goes on to say in that same verse, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. But fathers, parents, do not provoke your children to wrath. Do not provoke your children to wrath. That's what most parents do, right? Because they read that scripture and think that means the parents are always right. No, that's why he said do not provoke your children to wrath. They become wrathful because you're wrong or because you don't listen. You can't yell and scream at a child all their life. And then when they let all that, you know, marinate and then it grows up until become a sinner because they, they have the same profane mouth that you have. Right. If they don't clean their room it's because you pass down that horrible behavior, not cleaning your room. If they are dirty it's because you showed them how to be dirty. Kids are a reflection of who they're around and they're around you more than anybody. So if you're not saved, why, why would you expect them to be saved? If you don't follow God, why would they follow God? If you don't pray, why would they pray? It's a man. Listen, I'm telling you, do not provoke your children to wrath. 
be the example that you want to see on the earth. Like that's, that's some earthly stuff, but that's it's biblical too. Be the change that you want to see. God has given us all the power to be the change. All we got to do is get up and be. Get up and have the faith to stand. Get up and have the faith to pray, to fast when he said fast, to, to work when he said work, to preach when he said preach, to reach out to this person and give money to whoever he said give money to because it's all working together, right? Romans 8, what is that? Romans 8, 28. We have faith that all things work together for the good of those who love God and who are the called according to his purpose. He's not going to call you to do something that he, he knows you can't provide for because everything God asks you to do, he provides for. He will give you the money, which is why I was telling you earlier that if God give you some super love sum of money, don't think it's for you. God is giving you that to hold on to. So when he asks you to give it back, he expects you to give it back. Right. We can. It's so many. It's so many scriptures, man. So many, so many, so many. But we're going to just keep moving because I don't want to hold y'all up too much. So also sin keeps other people from moving against a purpose. Because think about it like this. I knew I was called to do this a long time ago, but I got unconfident, right? I didn't have enough faith-filled people around me, enough spirit-filled people around me. So when you get in a spirit and you're going to certain places where there, there is no spirit, where it's dry, where it's a dry, barren land, all you can do is give. All you can do is pour out, pour out, pour out, pour out. But when you go to church with people that's actually in the Holy Spirit, as much as you give them, they give you. So I'm, I'm pouring out my spirit, joy, love, peace, patience. They're pouring back into me the same things. So when I leave church, I feel overflowed. I feel great, right? And that's how it should always be every day. Because I can get into the spirit at any time. But if you can't, then I don't need to be around you because the Bible calls that being unequally yoked. Right. Just as iron sharpens iron, a friend sharpens a friend. So if I'm a spirit filled believer and you're not a spirit filled believer, we can't really like I can try to help you. But as far as be around you too long, because all you're going to do is suck the energy out of me because you're not on the same level, which is why Jesus can only take certain disciples with him when he went certain places. Right. He had a, a total of 12 disciples, but he only took three. He only took three main disciples when he went to pray. He took three main disciples when he went to do important tasks. And that was Peter, James and John, because their faith was so outstanding that he could trust them. The other disciples, they were still disciples. They would still have the same power, the same authority. But he couldn't take them into the private rooms because he couldn't trust them enough faith wise. He knew their faith wasn't strong enough as Peter's, James and John's. So moving on. So I told you what is the sorrow of the world. So I'm going to ask one more question. What kind of repentance is God looking for? And that's the Bible proves this in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. I'm going to read it directly from the Bible. If my people who are called by my name, right? We believe that all things work together for those who love God and who are the called according to his purpose. So if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, seek my way, seek my way of doing things and turn from their wicked ways to repent, to turn from your way, turn the way you've been, turn from the way you've been doing it, to repent. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. So sometimes it's as easy as how have I been doing things? Like if it's not working, how have I been doing it? Pray to God, understand that you are doing it wrong. So don't be prideful. Don't go into, into your prayer being prideful, being going to your prayer, willing to receive, willing to accept what he tell you. Because he might tell you to quit that job. He might tell you that that girl that you've been dating for nine months, you need to break that off right now. That person that you've been trying to um, be, a, be be attractive to, be an appealing to, he might tell you, you need to stop all that and be modest because I have something for you in a different state. I've seen God get people that live in Texas and move them all the way to Las Vegas because their wife is going to a church in Las Vegas. Like, you don't know how the spirit works, but you have to be willing to receive what he gives you. Even if that means you can't play video games. Even if that means you can't date that woman that you've been dating for three years. God has someone else for you. That's why y'all haven't gotten married yet. But you can't operate in your own strength because if you operate in your own strength, God will not bless you. So it makes so much more sense to just go into prayer, be humble, be obedient to what he asks you to do, and then let him figure it out. Because if he asks you to move somewhere and you can't afford it, best believe he's going to provide for you. He will provide. I've seen it happen. He will build a house for you to so get because the Lord is the Lord of all. He is the king of all things. Money means nothing to God. Finance, houses, home, safety, protection. That means nothing to God. If you trust him, if you trust him with your whole heart, and that's the first commandment of the Ten Commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind and your soul. You're supposed to love the Lord your God with everything you got. And when you do that, he will always come through for you. Trust that. So I got one more um, 
one more point and we'll, we'll call it a day. Once we learn to take repentance seriously, we are now, we're finally allowing God to leave the box that religion has placed him in. Because religion, pe religious people tell you that we don't cast out demons. I've never seen nobody cast out a demon. I've never seen nobody heal the sick. I, I, I've never seen that. That, means, that must mean that's a metaphor. Like, man, I went to one church. I was watching an online service one time and I was so, I wanted to scream to the top of my lungs. I was so mad. This guy said that the Bible is 75% metaphor. There's literally nothing metaphorical about the Bible. It is 100% true. We can cast out demons because I've done it. We can heal the sick because I've done it. We can heal maladies because I've done it. Now, I've never restored the sight to the blind or restored hearing, but you can do that too. By faith, right? By faith, you can do those things. By faith, we speak in tongues and we know we're talking to the Father. By faith, we can prophesy in dreams and understand how it reacts, I mean, how, how it relates to what we're going through. By faith, can we receive a prophecy from someone else that we don't know and God tells us to speak it to them and we speak it to them and they light up the world with their big smile because they didn't know that God heard their prayers. And because they're not in the spirit enough, God used you to let them know that I heard their prayers. All of that stuff matters, all of it. So you got to be open and willing to do what God asks you to do, which First of all, you got to repent. You got to turn from how you've been doing things and accept the way he tells you to do it. And once you do that, he becomes the Lord of your life and he will always, always come through. So um, I said, once we learn to take repentance seriously, we are now allowing God to leave the box that religion, unfortunately, has placed him in. So what is religion, right? You wonder, because everybody calls Christians religious. That's not religious. Religion would be the Pharisees, the people who follow all the rules, but they can't understand who God's presence is because they've never saw his face, right? It's one thing to know the Bible. It's another thing to recognize God while he's in front of you. It's, an, it's, it's a whole different thing to know God and how God relates to everything in this world than it is to just know scripture. A lot of people can know scripture, but the Holy Spirit is what shows you that wisdom. This is God's work. This, God sent this person to you for a reason. The devil's attacking you for a reason. Like if you're going through these attacks, it's because the devil's trying to keep you from something. So don't ever get discouraged and think that he has authority. He knows what God has planned for you and he's trying to stop you from getting to it. So you can't never let the doubt, the fear, the, the worry, the anxiety sit, like take root in your heart because whatever we feed is going to take root. We want faith to take root. And that's why we got to trust in Lord because faith is what activates God's power. Doubt, that stops God's power. Fear stops God's power. Faith always activates his power. And it will activate more. The more you grow in faith, because faith come by hearing and hearing the word of God. So the more you hear the word of God, the more you read the word of God, the more you intake the word of God, your faith will increase. So um, let me define religion for you so we can get one more scripture to get out of here. Religion is defined as a personal set of institutionalized systems of attitudes, beliefs, and practices. So like, you know, all the scriptures, you know how it's supposed to be done. But if Jesus Christ walked up right in your face, would you know who he is? The only way I would be able to do that is because I stay in God's presence. The Holy Spirit would bear, bear witness with my spirit. I would feel something when he gets close to me. I, I can feel my heart. I can feel, okay, how do I say this? I can feel my body being set ablaze. That's how it feels when the Holy Spirit is within you. He like he doesn't because he doesn't stay forever. He comes, he gives you what he needs, and he goes back to heaven and go see what God needs. And because the thing is, the Holy Spirit only speaks on Jesus Christ's behalf. So he's always going back and forth to heaven every day. He's going back and forth to heaven all throughout the day. So when you worship God, the Bible says that he is enthroned in the praises of Israel. So when you worship God and you feel that he come upon you, that's the Holy Spirit. When you are hearing some good preaching, you feel that conviction in your heart, that means you need to change something. That's the Holy Spirit pulling your heart to tell you this is a sin. I gave that to the preacher to say that to you at this specific time for this specific reason so that you can repent, turn from your wicked ways and let me back into your heart because I'm trying to get there, right? You've already been saved, but you're doing things the wrong way. It's the reason why the preacher called you out right there, right? It's not about personal things. We say what the Holy Spirit gives us to say. And then we don't know who is going to help. We just put it out there and then we get the testimonies later. And most times it's pretty good. Sometimes it's going to be bad, right? We just got to keep rolling with the punches because we know the Holy Spirit is true. It's not coming from me. I don't know you. I don't know you from a can of paint. But I know what the Holy Spirit is asking me to say at this moment. So we just go from there. I have one more scripture to, to drive it home. And this is Colossians chapter 2, verses 20 through 23. I'm going to read it directly from the Bible. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, which is the, you know, the demonic, the, the, the angels, the, the fallen angels, the principalities, the dominions, everything that the Bible says about it. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, when I was talking about Zeus and Hercules and all these false gods, they're real. 
but they're not gods, right? They've become twisted and disfigured because they tried to become God. They tried to become the main God, but the main God ain't having it. So he put all of them under his subjection, all of them under his toes, all his, under his footstool, right? He says that heaven is my throne. They don't live in heaven. They live on Mount Olympus. Mount Olympus is where? In Greece. The Roman gods live where? On some mountain in Rome, right? They never live in heaven. He lives in heaven. Earth is his footstool. So that, that lets you know right there, it's a completely different thing between our, our, our life and God's life. It's a different, completely different thing between Satan's desires and God's desires because God lives in heaven. Satan is on earth. It's a completely different thing. So let me read this, this scripture to you. Colossians chapter 2, verses 20 through 23. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, the, the world is darkness, right? It's evil. Why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to the world's rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body. But they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. What he's saying is the difference between religion and the difference, the difference between religion and real faith. Because I said by faith, we get saved. By faith, we receive the Holy Spirit. The only way we can endure sin and not give into it is by the Holy Spirit's power. It's not because our flesh is so strong. It's because the Holy Spirit is stronger within us. The more we allow him to be in us, the more he is able to show his power. And then Satan can't get you. He, he can try all these different attacks. He can't get you. Right. And what does he say? Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body. When they say you can't eat pork, did the Bible say that? The Bible says that everything that I've made clean is now clean when you eat it with thanksgiving. So you can eat pork. You can eat seafood. You can eat crawfish. You can eat crabs. Don't let these people in these religious circles get you caught up. Read your word for yourself rightly because the Bible says that we have to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Don't go to the pastor and let him tell a lie to you and don't go pray about everything he said. Even me, if you think I'm wrong, go pray about it. Go ask the Holy Spirit to reveal it to you. Go, go to the scriptures that I'm saying and go read them for yourself and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal what he's saying to you and see if I'm telling you a lie. I'm not, but I want you to know that it's not me that's speaking, it's the Holy Spirit. Everything I'm doing has been vetted. Everything I'm doing has been prayed over. Everything I'm doing has, you know, is approved to be said. I'm not just speaking out of my own feelings, right? So... This is why I was telling y'all about religion and the Pharisees because they knew all the rules. They knew the whole law. They knew every part of the law. But when Jesus Christ was standing right in front of them, they called him a blasphemer. They called him a blasphemer because they thought that God would never come in the flesh. But it's in the, it's in the book of Daniel that the son of man comes down. It's in the book of Ezekiel that the son of man was coming. It's in the book of Jeremiah the son of man was coming. It's in the prophet Habakkuk, Hab Habakkuk that the prophet is coming. It's in the book of Zechariah that Jesus Christ is coming. They, it never said his name, Jesus Christ. That's why it says son of man or son of God or bread of life. Or It had those, those little ter pejorative terms. At the end of the day, we knew it meant Jesus Christ. And when he was standing right in front of them doing miracles, preaching the gospel, they called him a blasphemer. Why? Because they knew all the rules. They were religious. They had every single rule that humans have made up. But what they, they didn't have, they didn't know the presence of God. They didn't know where God was at and how God was moving in a current situation right now at this right at this very, very important time. But see, when I talk about religion, that's mostly about this modern stuff, right? I don't want you to have a bad outlook on the Pharisees because I want, I want you to understand where they're coming from. When you're in the Bible, you have to realize the Old Testament it ended with the book of Malachi. The book of Malachi was, according to Bible scholars, it was written and it was done 400 years before the book of Matthew. So 400 years before Jesus Christ showed up in the flesh, they had never heard from God from, you know, it was a long gap between, right? Now, some people might have, but it's not biblical. It's not, we can't prove it in the Bible that God was speaking at all or doing anything between the book of Malachi and the book of Matthew. That was a 400 year gap. So they probably got lost in it. They thought that the law that God had gave them in the beginning, this is the law of Moses. This is the Ten Commandments and all that. So this is, what's the word? Leviticus. 
Levit Leviticus, the book of Leviticus is all the laws of God. So they knew all of Leviticus. They knew every law, but they didn't know the book of Daniel. They didn't know what the son of man would look like. They didn't know how, what the son of man would do because it told us he was going to do miracles. It told us that he was going to set free the captives. So when they hear those words, they should have clicked in their head. This is Jesus Christ. When he talked to Peter, James, and John, when he was out there fishing, when he told them to cast the net, they knew immediately he was Jesus Christ because they saw the miracles. They knew what they read about the Savior and they saw him do it. And they completely, you know, they went right forward because he produced the same fruits that they knew to look for. So let's call it a day. Um, I'm thankful that y'all be with me to hear that message. I know sometimes I get a little long with it. I talk a little, but. You know, it's all it's all for a good reason, right? I'm, I'm zealous, I'm happy for this, and I want you to also grow in your faith so that you can become happy for this. Because once you know what God has for you, you will never disappoint, you'll never be disappointed, right? Even in tribulation, we joy in tribulation because we know whatever God has spoken to us will come to pass. So let's end it with a prayer. Father God, I'm asking for everyone on the sound of my voice, if they have not received salvation, that they come to you and they humbly repent, turn from their wicked ways, seek your face and do it your way. But the first step is always to receive salvation. So by faith, I'm speaking that someone under this sign of my voice will receive salvation. Everyone, if they haven't already, will receive salvation. Part number two is that by faith, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will come upon them. And they will now know that God is real. They will now know that God is still working in this world. They will now know that Satan is real. They will be able to discern between the voice of the Holy Spirit and the voice of Satan and the desires of their flesh. Because we always fight in a war. We always fight in a spiritual war between three different forces, our flesh, the devil, and God, right? So it's the Holy Spirit speaking to us and it's the devil speaking lies to us. And then we have our flesh that wants what it wants. And the only way we can overcome is by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I pray for everyone on the side of my voice that has been saved to receive the Holy Spirit and you give them a spiritual gift to let them know that it's real, right? Do do a little, do a little something personal for them to let them know that it's real. I know you, I've seen you do it for me. I've seen you do it for other people that I've prayed for. So I know you can do it. And I know you, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So I'm praying that if they don't have the faith to receive it, that you will increase their faith, right? So it's, I'm praying for salvation. I'm praying for an increasing faith. I'm praying for a better relationship with God. I'm praying for you to know who God is because God asked Peter, who does the world say I am? They didn't know, right? That includes the Pharisees. They didn't know who the world, the world didn't know who Jesus Christ was. He asked Peter, who do you say I am? He said, you are the son of God. And then Jesus, you know, he lit up, he saw a smile and he said, how did you know that? The only way you could have known that I'm the son of God is that my father, the, through the Holy Spirit, sent it to you. Right. So it, even before Jesus Christ had died on the cross, the Holy Spirit was always working. Uh, David beat Goliath through the work of the Holy Spirit. Samson beat the Philistines through the work of the Holy Spirit. All of these things were the Holy Spirit working. Moses, he had a stuttering problem, but he didn't stutter when he went up to Pharaoh. Why? Because the Holy Spirit was working in him. So all of these things make a make a difference. And I want everyone who claims to be a Christian, who wants to be a Christian, to understand this power, to obtain this power, because it's freely given. It's not nothing that we can earn. We can never earn the grace that you've given us, but it's freely given. And if you reject the son, you reject the father also. And if you accept the son, you accepted the father also. So it's all about acceptance, accepting the one gift that God has given us, because the Bible says that the only unforgivable sin, the only sin that Jesus can't pay for is if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit. So if you have been saved, you haven't received the Holy Spirit, or you haven't allowed him to work in your life, you can still go to hell. Christians can go to hell. People that say can still go to hell. It's all about being born of the water, which is to be saved by Jesus Christ, be born of the living water, and then be born of the spirit, which is the Holy Spirit. And he will direct your path. He will show you what to do and what God needs you to do at this specific time period. Because we all were born for this time period right now. The fact that we live in the last day show you that God trusts you. God trusts you enough to birth you in the last days to be part of the people that preach the gospel to the final few nations before the world ends. Like God really trusts us enough to give us this kind of assignment. So we really got to take it seriously. We don't want to be left behind. We want to be having a mansion in heaven. We want to be living nice. We want to have the glorious body. We want to be able to have fellowship with Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, the whole nine, Abraham, Sarah, Leah, Rachel, Joseph, Simeon, Levi, Reuben, so many people, so many people I want to talk to, ask questions, like just, ah, man, I, in Jesus' name, I pray, amen.